Well, hey guys, good morning and welcome to Mercy Online. I'm your host, Jessica Murray. I'm the communications coordinator right here at Mercy Church. And today I'm joined by... Good morning. My name is Alan Warohio and I'm the outgoing student ministry director and the ingoing <laughs> church planting resident. I don't even know my title anymore. When you said that on Sunday, you yes. said I'm the outgoing students director. And I thought he is really outgoing. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh wait, that's not what he means. No, he that's means not that what I mean. We are training up a new students director yes. in your place so that you can take a church plant oh that's just to my Kenya. place that's his heart but yeah wow <laughs> oh my goodness how, how are you doing with that i'm doing well yeah uh, it's great um you know i was thinking um you look so sharp and i just i mean like a t-shirt and a and pairs of shorts and I, I felt so bad i was like man i need to glam up for the morning show but this is students director yeah this you is, gotta be ready to uh, hang with the students yeah yeah and i gotta be ready to Communicate. communicate. So let's tell the people what's going on. No, before we do that, we're really glad that you guys are here this morning. If you haven't joined us before and you're wondering who we are and what we're doing and why we're talking to you, we are staff members here at Mercy Church and we are just here on the online service to make you feel welcomed. We want you to know that we care deeply about you, even though you're watching on an online space and yes. you're not in person with us. We care about you. We would love to know who you are. Yes. So if you want to drop your name drop in, it the, in chat, the chat, we would it, love it in the to chat. meet you virtually and we would love to know where you're watching from. Yes. We actually have people that watch all over the place. All I know over the world. Summer's coming to an end, but it's not over yet. People are still out there on vacation. They so are. You're, you're watching this at the beach? We want to know. If you're watching this in the mountains. We want to know. I'm sorry you couldn't be at the beach. But Drop no, I'm just chat. kidding. Some people love the mountains. <laughs> not me. What about you? Mountains or beach? I, I can do both. I enjoy well, beaches. Well, yeah. <laughs> especially the the, 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 South, the North Carolina beaches. Yeah, are awesome. they are. Unlike the Texas ones. But I also love the mountains. Okay, okay. Yeah. So Interesting. I can, I can do both. But on a good day, I just want to be up in the mountains, just chilling on a rainy day, drinking my coffee, no, maybe listening not. to some music or reading a book. Catch me on the beach. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, we are so glad you are with us. Alan, what do we need to tell them about today? What so events do we have going today on? Today we have, uh, before we get to the events, yeah. we have a guest uh, speaker. We do. We oh, almost gotta forgot. got to be here for that because it's the word is going to just be so powerful. Yeah. You are going to be so fired up to go and share the gospel in your community. Yeah. We have Promotion Sunday coming up. We do. You want to tell them more about it? All right. Yes. <laughs> Promotion Sunday is coming August 15th. Mercy K and Mercy students moving yes. up from Mercy Kids going to Mercy students moving up from 5th grade going to 6th moving up from 4th to 5th yeah all the all the grades are moving up what is it called all the milestones all that the was miles, the word I was looking all for the milestones. milestones and this is an important yes. milestone for us to mark as we see our students our kids moving uh, one grade up and as they continue growing in the knowledge of yeah. who God is what the church is what the people of God do and how they operate it's going to be awesome so you have to be here yeah. in person or online to celebrate our kids and students yeah absolutely another event that we have coming up if you're watching online and you are over the age of 50 I think it's if you're 50 or older. Yes. We have a group of people in our church that call themselves the prime. prime time. Yeah, the prime group. And they're having a prime time hangout. Prime so time. if you are in the prime of life, you've got to come hang out with the other people that are in your age bracket. I think they're having dinner. Nice. They're playing trivia together. Nice. And they're just going to like fellowship and spend time getting to know one another. So yeah, if you're in that age bracket, you should definitely check that event out. And then the last thing we have for you guys is the Mercy Students Back to School Back to School school and promotion bash this is the first time incoming sixth graders are going to hang out with students and it's going to be the saturday august 21st yep. at the providence campus from 11 to 1 p.m you will get to meet the new students director brett bolden he yep. is awesome get to meet all the other leaders your students are going to be welcome so if you have a fifth grader that is going into sixth grade this is where you, you need to go to the website mercycharlotte.com slash events no mercycharlotte.com slash news uh, i bet you someone okay. out there said it someone was like alan it's news it's news not events <laughs> it should be events but anyway <laughs> sign up your, your students and uh if you have a sixth grader all the way to 12th grader this yeah. is also a place for them to come have fun and usher in the new school year yeah it's gonna absolutely. be epic fun and 
get to know the mission and vision of student ministry. Yeah, for yes. sure. Gosh, we do. We have a lot of events going on yes. over the next month, but it's a really great time. I know we're ending summer, getting ready to go back to school. Yeah. But gosh, one last time to hang out, especially for those students. Yes. I think that's what it says on the website. One last time one to hang out. One last hang out before back to <laughs> before the land of to homework, tests, papers. I'm glad I don't have to do that Some anymore. Some of the students <laughs> are so excited to be in person. Some are like, oh, no, true. I'm used to homeschool. I just yeah. want to be home now. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting school year it is now it's time to worship we are going to get into the service yep. it's going to be, uh, this is how it works out uh, we're going to have a sermon we're going to have first we're going to do music we're going to worship our lord yep. in music and then we're going to have a sermon more music and then we'll be back to yep. say goodbye so do not go anywhere whatever it is that you do here's what we say put your coffee down hands up hands up let's worship the lord oh lord my god when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds that hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. Scares can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bury he bled and died to take away my sin. This is my soul, my sin. Jesus, wish out of acclamation and take me home. With joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration. Good morning. Um, my name's Spence. I'm the lead pastor here at Mercy. It's just been a few weeks since I've been preaching. Uh, every summer, I take a few weeks and just spend time with the Lord and with my family, reflecting and preparing for the next season. And each time it's tough to go. And each time, man, the Lord blesses it. 
And each time I'm excited to get back and I can't wait to be back preaching next weekend as we finish up our Acts series called You Are Sent. And then we're stepping into uh, the Song of Solomon starting in mid-September. Oh, I'm so excited about that. I think it's a good word for us. Um, can't wait to be back with you guys, but thank you so much for how you have blessed and encouraged our other preachers on our staff um, in my absence. Now, listen, I want to introduce you to our preacher this morning. This one, I can't tell you how excited I am um, to have this particular preacher here this morning. I can't share his name with you, and he'll explain why, but he serves overseas in a region of the world that is closed to the gospel, and he serves as a missionary over there. Now, He'll explain why, but I thought in our You Are Sent series, what better way, what better way to really articulate and express how sincere we are in believing that God is calling each of us out with the gospel wherever we are, and he's calling some of us to the far ends of the earth. Uh, what better way to express that than actually bring a friend who has followed the Lord into that calling to the far ends of the earth. So please join me in welcoming um, a dear friend of mine, and I uh, can't share his name, so this guy, uh, to the stage to preach uh, God's Word to us. Well, good morning to you, Mercy Church. My name is Craig, and I can tell you that. That's about all I'm going to tell you, though, or my friend Scott over there will have to kill you. Uh, but uh, it's, it's good to be here with you this morning. Spence and Courtney, they're dear friends of my wife and I. Uh, we served on staff together a number of years. I see Spence as a mentor and a friend. Very grateful uh, for the time that I was able to spend with him a number of years ago together working on staff and serving the Lord together. And grateful for the friendship and partnership that has borne out of that with this church I feel like the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to Romans, he was longing to be there and to impart some spiritual gift or to encourage them. I feel like that a bit this morning, following your journey as a church for a number of years. I've just been excited for the day when I can just come and be with you. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me for the first time to be with you, to actually be able to share God's word with you uh, this morning. And I also want to thank you because you, as a church, whether you know this or not, are partnered deeply with us, our family, and our team. Just because you partner with us uh, as, a, as a network of many churches across the nation that send all, us and people from our organization to do the work around the world, I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness, for your giving, for your support, for your prayers, even for your sending. I'm about to welcome a teammate from this church in a number of weeks who will join us in the work in South Asia. So thank you from the bottom of our heart, from our family, and excited for many more years of partnership. Well, I, I would like to give just a general introduction to who we are, my family and I. Uh, we have been in South Asia for about 10 years. We are serving as what we call catalytic church planter, planters or church planting, meaning our primary church planting activity actually happens alongside of national brothers and sisters in the, in, in the areas where we work. We believe that they're going to be there longer, they're more effective in the language and understanding the culture, so we come alongside of brothers and sisters in the work of church planting in that area. We sensed a number of years ago that God had set us apart, meaning God had called us to be a part, to, to basically spend our lives taking the gospel to unreached peoples and unreached Places. Unreached peoples basically means for us or for our understanding those who have little to no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, there are places, large uh, pockets of places on earth where you can find peoples, large groups of peoples who've never even heard the name of Jesus, don't know about a God who loves them and has a desire to save them. So our family have, have decided to answer that call and go and, and spend our lives we spent the last 10 years, and by God's grace, we'll continue to do that work for many more years to come. I want to share with you our vision uh, as a team and a team of teams in, in the place where we work. Our vision, it's important for me to share that with you this morning because I feel like the text and the message that God has put in our hearts, put in my heart this morning, uh, is in, it's, it's helpful to understand our vision uh, as a team. Our vision and what we're trying to accomplish in South Asia together is local ownership of what we call the core missionary task for every people in place. 
That is what our vision is. That is what we're praying for God to do in our context. Local ownership means local brothers and sisters in a place where we're serving, where there's few believers population-wise, would take ownership, would fully uh, own the task of taking the gospel to every people in place in that context. Praise God. That's what we're working for and laboring with. I invite you to pray along uh, with us in that endeavor. Well, I love where the Lord has allowed me to jump into the life of your church in this series. Uh, it's just an exciting thing for me to be able to jump in in the book of Acts, particularly even at the place in which we find ourselves this morning. Uh, this is an exciting series for me. hope it has been for you. You are sent I really believe that. I love that you guys uh, embody that and challenge each other in that. And just the the series theme for right now, planning to go, willing to stay, I just trust that God is working in the lives and the hearts of many of you, stirring in you whether or not you may be uh, more engaged in the missionary task to one degree or another. I'm just excited to uh, be with you. Um, I'm going to be picking up today in the book of Acts, chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there, Acts chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. As you're turning there, just I want to give, a, give a, somewhat of an introduction to this text. I think a, a casual reading, an approach to reading through the book of Acts, you may be tempted to maybe even skim or skip over this passage, not skipping over it in the sense of not reading it, but not paying much mind to what's going on, maybe because the names in the text are quite difficult to read, or, or maybe it's just because Luke is, for whatever reason, seemingly fast-forwarding through a number of instances without much detail. He seems to be going on uh, to the next point very quickly, but at the same time, I really do believe that if there are disciple-makers in the room, uh, and, and you have labored hard for years to win people to faith and disciple them to become alongside of you laborers in the work, you will find this uh, text uh, to be very uh, near to your heart. It will be something that you will not miss, this gem, as we read it together. Read it with me as I read. After the uproar ceased... Paul sent forth the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed to Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return to Mas- through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Phyrus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, Gaius and Derby, uh, Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. And yes, I practice all week to try to say those things uh, <laughs> properly uh, before you this morning. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of the unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them. At Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Pray with me this morning, church. God, we are grateful uh, to be able to open your word and to seek to understand what you have to communicate to us through it. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides our understanding. We pray that this morning all that you have to say to us and to speak to us and open our minds to in, in terms of your word and the pattern that we see here laid out for us and how we to do, are to do ministry. God, I pray that we'd be faithful to it. God, we celebrate the work that you've accomplished up to this point in the book of Acts, and we celebrate the work that you've done at this point in Mercy Church. We know that you went on to do much through these disciples of Paul, and we know that you will go on to do much in the, through the lives of the people here at Mercy. We pray that you would continue to do that work through us, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, to get our minds warmed up a bit this morning, I just want to ask a few questions, a food for thought type of thing. just want you to get the wheels churning in your mind. What's the legacy of Mercy Church going to be? And what is the summation of your life going to look like, similar to what we see a picture of here in Paul? 
You know, I know we've all probably been watching the Olympics uh, recently, so to put it this way, who are you going to pass the baton off to in your ministry? And, and is that person going to know which part of the race and how to run that race and which lane to run in once they receive that baton? Will those disciples know what to do? What's it going to look like when you get to the end of your run? Who's going to be there with you on your team? Who's going to be celebrating with you? Who's going to be taking the place when it's time, your place when it's time to hang it up? Where will your disciples be working? Or even better yet, we should ask the questions, will there be any disciples with you at the end of your ministry run, at the end of the time when the Lord calls you home? Where will you be sending them? Where will they be working? Or even which unreached peoples will they have engaged and have alongside of them like we see Paul in this context? See, in this passage, Luke gives us a very brief overview of Paul's team activity, but then seems to go slow down a bit. He's he's going very quickly through uh, the events of what happens, but he slows down and mentions several names and places to where they came from. Behind every one of these co-workers is a story of how God worked through Paul and his teammates to reach the peoples of those places, and specifically those, those people mentioned, and how they came to be a part of Paul's apostolic team. I think the, the picture that, that Luke is trying to paint here is, in, is an incredibly committed group that are focused on a common task uh, together. This morning, I really want to just zoom out for a few moments uh, in this text and kind of look back of what God has done in the past previous uh, seven chapters leading up to this point and see how God has worked a, through Paul and through his team to the point of Paul having this robust team that he's sending here and there and everywhere. He entrusts this same pattern of ministry to his disciples, Paul did, and they were faithful to f- follow the pattern that was set before them. So that's what I, want to discuss this, what I want to discuss this morning. My big idea, the main point that I want us to discover here this morning, is that commitment to a biblical pattern of missionary resu- work results in widespread advancement of the gospel among all peoples and places through the disciples we make. Commitment to a biblical pattern of missionary work results in widespread advancement of the gospel among all peoples and places through the disciples we make. My aim is to inspire you as a church to not just have missions on your calendar, but that mission would be the identity of this church. And, and my, my, my aim and my prayer for you as an individual, as a disciple maker, is that you would not just have mission activity on your checklist, but that you would have mission activity that would define your calendar and dictate your decisions. This morning we're going to discuss three main things that we need in order to fulfill this great commission that God has called us to as a church, as individual followers of Christ. The first main thing we need, I think embodied here by the Apostle Paul, is we need a big vision. Now let's look at the life of Paul a little bit, particularly uh, the call of Paul, the Apostle. We all probably are familiar with Paul's background As a persecutor of the church, we know that he grew up as a Jew and did not immediately receive Jesus as the Messiah. But I don't want to focus too much on that. I really want to pay specific attention to Paul's calling to ministry. If you look at at Acts chapter 9, we see the Lord describe Paul as a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Fast forward to Acts 13. He says, uh, the Holy Spirit instructs the church in Antioch, where Paul was at the time, to release Paul and Barnabas, his teammate, for the work that he had called them to do. And then immediately in the next seven chapters up through 20, we see Paul implement this pattern of ministry that we're going to talk about specifically this morning. He started into this, this Asia region 
and preach the gospel in new places. Paul, articulating his own call to the Roman church in Romans chapter 1, calls himself an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, whom, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, among all peoples. That's how Paul understood his calling from God, but also in light of God's vision for what he was doing in the world. See, Paul caught a vision of God's vision and understood his call in light of God's vision and not the other way around. It's vitally important for us to do the same, to get those things in right order. What's God's vision and then what is my vision uh, as a part of God's vision? I just thank you, brother, for sharing this morning uh, from the stage Revelation 7, 9, and 10. Because I believe that shares a picture for what is the vision of all eternity, the picture of what it's going to be like. I just want to read it again this morning and draw particular attention to a few things. After this, this is Revelation 7, verse 9 and 10. After this, I looked, this is uh, John speaking, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is a vision of worship in the new kingdom. This is what it's going to be like for all of eternity. Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people a multitude of them worshiping together the same Lord, the God who offers salvation to all peoples. Amen? Amen. Now, that is the vision for what eternity will be like, but the sad reality is there are places on earth where this is not the reality yet, which is why we are called to go and make disciples of all nations. God's plan of fulfilling this vision is made clear to us in the Great Commission that many of you could probably quote by heart, where Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Literally, that word means pantata ethne, the all of the ethnic groups. Go to all of the ethnic groups and make disciples. Jesus commissions us as his disciples to go and fulfill this commission. Now, I know this is review for us this morning, but I want to put that call and that vision in light of the context where I'm coming from. Uh, my family's been serving the last 10 years of our life. We, so we call what I'm about to tell you the brutal facts of South Asia. Brutal because when you read them, it's staggering. It's hard to, to conceptualize. It's hard to understand without being shaken or moved by the reality of what we're talking about. But the place where we serve the seven countries uh, that make up South Asia, there's 1.7 billion people that call that place home. Alongside of that, there are 1,975 unreached peoples, meaning there's little to no access to these communities, these ethnic groups that are unique to themselves. And if not uh, there's probably some sort of barrier to the gospel by which they're unreached at this point. But there are 1,975 of them just in our region of the world. In our region of the world, in South Asia, 237,000 people die every single day. That's three people every second. So three, six, nine. 12, 15 people just stepped into eternity under, the, under my breath at this time, most of which, if not all, have probably never had an opportunity to repent, never had an opportunity to call upon the name of Jesus because no one has taken the gospel to them yet. Now, friends, that needs to change. Every person is loved by God, and he has a desire for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, going back to the sermon series that we're talking about, are you planning to go? 
hearing those stats and knowing that God's vision is before us and he has a calling upon us as a church and you as an individual. Maybe you're willing to stay, and and you should be willing to stay if that's what God is calling you to do. But only stay if you feel the Lord directing you specifically to stay. And, and, And in fact, I argue this all the time. I really believe that the assumption for us is that we are called to go. We should be going unless God is very specific with us that we should be staying and engaging in missionary or ministry activity here as a part of the church. You know, uh, if you look at the Gospels and Jesus in his ministry, the assumption was that anyone who came into faith would come along with him and be a follower with him. And that is actually what Jesus invited most people to do, except for the case in Mark chapter 5, if you're familiar with the demon-possessed man. You maybe have heard that story before. Now, Jesus healed this man who was uh, demon-possessed, and this guy probably heard what it was like. Well, if you, Jesus heals you and you believe on him, you just join him in the boat and you keep sailing, right? Well, this demon-possessed man was about to step into the boat with Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus says, wait. Now, it wasn't because Jesus was worried about his reputation, because we know that Jesus hung around with people that didn't have great reputation. But Jesus had a vision for him to go home. Jesus said, no, you go and tell your friends what the Lord has done in your life. And you know what he did? He went to ten cities, it says, the Bible says. And all marveled at what God had done through that man. See, that might be the vision by which God has asked you to be willing to stay. But I really believe those are the contexts by which we should be evaluating. Are we planning to go and willing to stay? I hope, church, that we are wrestling with these questions and always asking the Lord to give clarity. Paul said in Romans 15, after the end of his third journey, he says this to the church in Rome as he's writing, about to go visit them. From Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where, no, where Christ has not been already named. That is the call of a missionary. That is the call that God calls us to as a church, to be a part of taking the gospel to the unreached peoples. In other words, Paul's vision was to go where the church wasn't. Some of us need to hear and be reminded of these realities because we need to get serious about increasing our involvement in prayer and giving and sending. And I get that because we're, we're willing to stay because God has called us to stay like this demon-possessed man, to be a blessing and to be a part of what God's doing here. But others of us need to embrace the call that the Holy Spirit may be whispering or screaming in your life to go and to be a part of what he is doing among the nations. Once we have a big vision, we need a biblical pattern to follow for how we implement our missionary activity. Now, I realize that there are likely any number of things that might come to mind for some of you as I mentioned that we are involved in missionary work. And and honestly, it kind of grieves my heart that as a church, I'm speaking to us, we often don't get this right. We often don't understand what we mean, or we're very confused about what being a missionary, what mission activity is. You see, Paul followed a pattern of ministry that we can clearly see in Acts 13 through 20. He makes reference to his perspective as well, many places in Scripture. And I want to share uh, a couple of those places that I think will help illuminate us to uh, how he approached his work as well. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 and 2, Paul says to Timothy, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many Witnesses, And it's quite possible that some of those witnesses he's talking about are the very people who I mentioned in Acts 20, verse 4, that I'm not going to repeat their names again because I'm afraid I'm going to stumble on them. But it very well could have been those, those witnesses that he was talking about. And the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men. And the text literally could be men and women there, brethren, who will be able to teach others Also, Paul's perspective on ministry was that he expected his disciple Timothy to remember the things that he had taught and to be able to teach those things uh, to others also, who would teach them to others 
also, who would teach them to others also. Paul had a pattern. He had a set of teachings, a way about which he taught that he expected people to remember and reproduce. Now, either Timothy had an incredible memory, of which I would be ruled out if that was uh, me in that context, or Paul's teachings were simple and repetitive in nature so that it would have been easy for Timothy to remember, oh yes, that's the set of ten teachings on discipleship. And that's the set of ten teachings on church formation that Paul is talking about. See, I believe the, the latter, that Paul had a way of simply using a pattern uh, of ministry that his disciples were able to implement and follow. Also in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16 and 17, Paul says to the Corinthian church, I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I left... That's what, sorry, that's why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you, get this, of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. <laughs> now Paul has already taught that these things to the Corinthian church. He's sending Timothy back to remind him of the things that he teaches everywhere and in every church. Paul had a pattern. Paul got the gospel the gospel doesn't change. Paul was able to articulate the gospel and to train up his team to be very clear in what they did. Paul's way of life and core teachings were taught in every church that he started and visited and were retaught and reviewed by Paul's missionary team members as they came to visit. Put simply, Paul exemplified what he taught Remember, he said, remind you of my ways in Christ. Paul didn't just teach. Paul was doing the work of sharing and discipling and teaching how to do that also. And his disciples were able to replicate his way of life and his teachings to others. So what is this pattern that Paul followed? I'm just excited uh, to, to tell you more about it, but wouldn't it be awesome if, if Paul would just have given us his, his teachings, like, hey, here's my sermon set for the last 15 years. You know, that would have been awesome. But he did give us a blueprint of what that looked like, and, and thanks to, thank you to uh, Luke, who wrote those things down for us, but we see a pattern by which Paul did his ministry. And what I want to share with you this morning about this pattern is Paul had six main components uh, that made up his strategy, his plan, his blueprint, his framework for ministry that we call the core missionary task. The first is engage the lost through prayer and strategy development. We repeatedly see Paul engaging new peoples, always going to new places. He gets opposition in one place. He doesn't stop and go back to Jerusalem. He goes on to the next place. We must take the gospel to unreached peoples and places. This is the heart of the missionary call. We need to gain a heart for the task of unreached peoples, of reaching unreached peoples through prayer. Listen to what Elizabeth Elliot, author and wife of the late Jim Elliot, missionary to South America, said about prayer. Prayer lays hold of God's plan and becomes the link between his will and its accomplishment on earth. Paul typically spent long days and nights. Just read the passage right after the one we just talked about, about the long nights, if you're curious about that. Believer, uh, with believers, encouraging them and strengthening them in their faith. We must faithfully disciple new believers. Excuse me, I went one uh, page ahead. We must uh, engage the loss through prayer and strategy development. Uh, I want to share a story quickly about the Mawasi peoples. Now, where I serve, we have a number of, of unengaged peoples, and uh, one of them was the Mawasi peoples that we were not seeing any activity among about two and a half years ago. So we committed to the latter part of two, uh, 2019 and 2020 to commit to praying for and, and vision casting for the Mawasi peoples. Now, as God would have it, in the year 2020, we found 69 people who were from the Mawasi background who called upon the name of the Lord. And 10 of them were baptized just last year. 
And we have a number of them who we're following up with. But God allowed us to have a vision for uh, unreached peoples, for us to have a, uh, gain a heart for them through prayer, and God opened a door among them that he had been working uh, out for a long time. The sad reality, though, of regarding missionaries sending is that approximately 80% of the unreached peoples on earth are what is found, found in what is called the 1040 window, an area of North Africa, Middle East, and uh, parts of Asia. 80% of the unreached peoples are, are living in that location where it's estimated that less than 5% of all global missionaries are sent to that location. Now that is out of balance, friends, if the call for us is to go among unreached peoples and places. I want to move ahead quickly. Evangelize the gospel faithfully and contextually. Everywhere Paul went and his teammates went, they shared the gospel upon arrival. The gospel never changed, but it's clear that Paul understood the gospel very well, and he also stood, understood the audience very well into how they would uh, receive that uh, message. We often teach that uh, we need to grow in three specific areas if we're going to be serious about regularly evangelizing the gospel uh, to others. We have to grow in confidence, grow in confidence of the power of the gospel to change lives. We have to grow in uh, competence, grow in our ability to accurately and effectively communicate the gospel. So confidence, competence, and commitment. We have to grow in the discipline of proactively and and regularly sharing the gospel. If we grow in those three areas through discipline, God will work mightily through you to win many people to faith. Because God desires that uh, we would be fruitful in our lives. I found that opening, asking God to open my eyes for daily opportunities to share about the good news with others is a great discipline for me to just say, God, open my eyes to see uh, the people that you have for me to share the gospel with today. I encourage you uh, to do the same. You know, when Paul faced opposition, he didn't stop sharing. He actually just went on to the next place. You might face opposition as well. But just go on to the next person because you don't know if God has prepared their heart for hearing. Equip new believers to be obedient to the faith. As I mentioned before, uh, Paul typically spent long days and nights with new believers, discipling them, strengthening them in the faith. We must faithfully disciple New believers. One of the most seasoned missionaries that I've ever been around, he once said this. He said, I've, uh, so most church plants never start, never get started because of a lack of robust follow up in the early discipleship of new believers. Think about that for a minute. Most churches never get started, he's talking about on our con- in our context, because of a lack of robust follow up in the new believer's life. Who knows what God would have done if we would have laid a better foundation in the lives of our disciples. Let that not be the case of this church. Let us plant many churches, all the churches that God has intended for us to plant because of our faithfulness in the area of discipleship. We must establish healthy churches, reproducing churches in new places. We see that Paul, everywhere he went, uh, he was engaged in the missionary task, and he always left behind a church. There's no other designation we find in Scripture of the people that, uh, that called upon the name of Jesus that Paul left behind but a church. He planted churches in these new places. And let me just ask you for a minute. Just put yourself in the context of some New Testament uh, church uh, growth context. If widespread persecution just broke out in this area, in this region of the world, so that all of us were scattered, no no longer able to meet in this area, we're all scattered to different places uh, throughout North Carolina in this region, and there was no church where you landed, would you know what to do to start a church? Would you know what it takes for you to engage, evangelize, disciple, gather people together, for the purpose of worshiping the Lord and growing together? The answer to that should be yes. That we would know what to do on a very simple level. That we would be able to gather people together and worship the Lord together. We must entrust the advancement of the kingdom to the next generation. When I say next generation, 
I, I'm not excluding uh, the, our kids and our children's ministries and our college ministries, but I'm definitely including that. What I mean specifically about the next generation is what a, sp- a spiritual generation. As Paul entrusted the work to Timothy and to other disciples, are we ready to entrust the, the ministry onto the next spiritual generation of our church, to be planting 100 churches uh, as, as uh, Mercy's committing to uh, here in the surrounding areas, or be a part of sending your best to be a part of what we're doing in South Asia. See, leadership development, it was very much a part of what Paul was doing. He developed mainly two types of leaders in uh, the, the book of Acts. We see him in every church that he planted was always going back and, and identifying and appointing local elders who would continue the pattern that he set before them, the, the building on the foundation that he had laid of the church. But he also identified and recruited co-workers like the ones mentioned in this text to come along with him and implement uh, the core missionary task in new places and also strengthening churches that he had, uh, Paul had been a part of starting. We need to be a church that is very focused on developing all kinds of leaders, specifically those who are sent out of this church and will go and plant new churches. And the sixth component that I want to share with you is Paul exited to partnership. There was, a, there was a time stamp on which Paul was involved in these churches. Paul never became the pastor of any of these churches. And any of his, none of his co-workers were ever given the title of elder of any of the churches that he had planted. His co-workers were set aside for a specific task, but they partnered deeply with the churches that he had planted. So now that we see Paul's pattern of engagement, evangelization, equipping, discipleship, establishing the church, entrusting the ministry and exit, I alliterated that for you, hopefully you can remember that. We just simply now, moving on to the third thing that we need, we need to boldly implement the pattern together. One of the main... uh, Case studies that we like to do uh, with our teammates that just arrive on the field is a study of Paul and his co-workers and how they understood the work and how they understood each other. It's always exciting for me to do that study with our new teammates. And uh, what I love about that study when I do it, I feel like every time I'm always encouraged about how much Paul wanted and even needed more teammates to always be joining him in the work. Now, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I was listening, uh, well, it wasn't a couple of weeks ago, but uh, a few weeks ago, I think Spence was sharing a message that I was listening to uh, for your church, and he said something like, I used to think that uh, missionaries were like the Navy SEALs of the Christian group, right? You guys remember that? I think it was Spence that mentioned that. It was one of the messages in this sermon, uh, sermon series. And, uh, you know, I laugh about that because I've heard that before, uh, but I just want to share with you how much that is not the case. And if you don't believe me, you can take the word of one of my teammates. Uh, See, a few, I'd say about a few months ago, maybe a little over a year ago, I was on a call with a sister church uh, of of Mercy and the college group there, and we were doing a recruiting call. I was trying to get two-year people to join. And one of my teammates was on the call uh, with us, and she was uh, basically introducing us. And she said something to the effect of, Now, if you've ever thought that missionaries were super Christians or the Navy SEALs, if you will, of Christians, I just want to encourage you, if you come and spend a couple of weeks with Craig, you will find out that that is not the case. (laughs) And I was on the call, and I know what she was trying to say, but I was just like, like, I get what you're trying to say, but you threw me under the bus there, you know? I mean, maybe you could have just said, like, well, they're great people, you know, but she was just like... If you just think that they're super Christians, just come and meet Craig, and you'll understand that they're very ordinary, lowly people. But it's the truth. Just take it from her that I am a prime example of how God uses faithful people to accomplish his vision among the nations. There's nothing special about us, nothing special about me or you. God uses ordinary believers who are empowered by the Holy Spirit and equipped 
by grace, with the gospel, to complete the work that he's called us to do. And you can be a part of that. The passage we read together, we just read together, gives the impression that Paul's team was working together on the same page, even in volatile situations. One of my dear colleagues uh, on the field is very famous for saying, often, you got to have a plan and you got to work the plan. Now, it's great for us to have a plan. It's great for us to have a pattern of ministry, but we need all of us to be engaged in this pattern and implement it together. God's shown us this biblical pattern, and we just need to be faithful to walk in it. Now, that same colleague labored, has been laboring for the last 15 years in his context. Now, the first eight of years of his time there, not very fruitful. But the last seven years of his ministry, it has been the most fruitful of any of our workers in the entire region because he has had a plan and he's worked a plan. His national partners know what to do, and he has countless, literally countless national partners, and they are planting thousands of house churches every single year because they have a plan and they work the plan. May that be the legacy of mercy. In our context, we have simple tools and methods that we use to train our national brothers and sisters in each one of these components we just talked about. Now, if you as a church or you as an individual do not have these tools, I know that the church here has them and is continually developing them. If you don't have these simple tools of how to engage through prayer, maybe even strategy development or evangelizing the lost, sharing the gospel, sharing your testimony, equipping new believers through discipleship, establishing new churches and trusting the work to the next generation of leaders, I'll invite you to come talk to Scott down here. Come talk to me. I'll be here all day. We would love to equip you with the simple tools of how to be faithful to follow this pattern before us. Now, by God's grace, our team, the specific team that I'm a part of uh, in a small area of of South Asia, in 2020, we saw uh, 1,975 new believers, uh, 766 baptisms. Yeah. We saw 135 new groups started, and of them, 20, uh, sorry, in addition to them, 28 healthy churches form. And that was touching 59 different people groups. Now, by God's grace, we've accomplished all that because we've followed the plan and implemented the plan. And the majority of all the things that I just mentioned were implemented by our faithful national brothers and sisters who are still working night and day as we're back here uh, celebrating with you and encouraging you and trying to inspire you to be, increase your involvement in what God is doing in, among the nations. Now, as I move towards concluding this message this morning, all of us probably have a mentor or a school teacher that we can kind of point back to that really shaped our life and our thinking. Now, for me, I had a, a high school history teacher, hated history, a high school history teacher, Mrs. Knox, And her way of teaching initially very much annoyed me. She was very repetitive. She um, didn't lecture very long, didn't teach a lot of new things, but she always was repetitive and reminding us of the highlights of all the things that we needed to know. Now, initially, it was a bit annoying for me. (laughs) But I was always ready for the exam. I always knew what to do when I was asked the questions that she put before me because of the way that she talked. You may have heard before that some people have said before that sermons don't change lives. Sentences do. And that's true. I believe that. You know, you're not going to remember much of what I said, but maybe you might remember one or two things. You need to have a big vision. You need to follow the pattern. You need to implement the pattern. Maybe those things you'll remember, and that'll change your perspective. You've probably also heard people say more is caught than taught. That's also true. It's the simple statements and the simple patterns that truly change lives. My prayer today is that we would be a church that that doesn't just have missionary activity on our calendar, but mission would be your identity as a church. I pray that you as an individual would have a big vision. You would implement the pattern and that you 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 would follow the pattern, you would implement the pattern. Let me pray for you, church. God, we're grateful to see in Scripture how you are accomplishing your vision. In an area of the world that 
was very difficult at the time, but not uh, too unlike the context that we are challenged to launch into. Now, Father, I pray for us as a church and as individual followers that we would be faithful to respond to the vision that you set before us and the commission to go. That we'd be planning to go and, and willing to stay if you call us, but I pray that you would make it clear. I pray that you would, you would guide us and we would be able to walk in faith, but we would walk in faith in, in great confidence that you were leading. I pray that you speak specifically to individuals as to how you would have them steward their time and talents and resources and treasures for the advancement of your kingdom, knowing that you are working about a plan through us, your disciples, to where there will be a multitude of people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and peoples that will worship you forever. We know that that's not the case yet. And therefore, we continue to keep our hands to the plow. Father, I pray that you'd make us faithful in all of these things. Teach us what it means to follow the pattern. Help us to be boldly implementing that pattern. And set your clear big vision before us that we may be spending our lives for this great task. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. It's the joining of the bride and the son, the two becoming one.
Amen, church. Amen. I know I say it every week and I'm going to say it again, but I love worshiping with our church. The other <laughs> week, oh, I was in the worship center at Providence Road. Yes. And I just closed my eyes and listened mm. and the sound of the saints worshiping. Mm. It fills my heart with joy every single week. It really so does. Good. That is one of the number one ways that I experience the goodness of the Lord. It's just worshiping with it's the saints. So good. So, By the way, if it. you would love to continue worshiping with the music you hear in service, yeah. you hear us worship together and go to Spotify. Yeah, and it's on search Spotify Mercy worship. or Apple. You can yeah. find our playlist. If you search Mercy Church, it's hard to say, search Mercy Church. Search Mercy Church, so, then search you will Mercy find Church. Uh, our worship playlist, mm-hmm. and you'll also find our sermon podcast. Yes. So if you ever missed one and you're like, man, wonder what the third sermon in that series was. Yes. I was at the beach. Then you can totally check it out there. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Well, we're so glad you got to join us today. If you do want to join us in the future for an in-person service, we have a 9 a.m. and an 11 a.m. service at our Providence Road campus. Yeah. And then we have a 4 p.m. at our Northeast campus. So right now, those are our rhythms. You can find out more at mercycharlotte.com slash plan your visit. You can see all the things you need to know, answer all those questions before you come join us in person. But we would love to meet you. And if you're planning to uh, be baptized or you feel like the Lord is leading you towards baptism, we have yeah. baptisms every last Sunday of the month. We do. It's time to get baptized. The Lord is saying it's time for you to follow through in that step of obedience. Talk yeah. to us. Drop it in the chat. Give us your name. Let's talk. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you want more information on any of the events we talked about, the yes. Mercy Students Back to School Bash, mm-hmm. the Prime Time Hangout, the there was one more. Promotion Sunday, promotion Mercy Sunday. Families Promotion Sunday, and the other events that are coming up. If you want information on any of those, just go to Mercy Charlotte. Mercy Charlotte. I'm stumbling over words today. Mercy Charlotte. Mercy Charlotte. Dot com. Dot com slash news. And you can find out all the information there. Also, some of those events require RSVPs. Yes. So it's helpful to RSVP for the ones that require that. So. Amen. All right. Mercy yeah. Church. That's it. We're done. We are. You are sent. You are sent.